Hello and welcome to our professor podcast. I'm Micah Sander. I'm Carter Green. I'm and... Fresh. Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> we have three hosts today. <laughs> today we have another co-host. <laughs> uh, um, today we are talking about Professor David Troyansky. Professor David Troyansky is a specialist in 18th and 19th century French history. He has published on the history of old age. French Provincial Culture, the French Revolution, and Transnational Space and Identities in the Francophone World. He returned to Brooklyn and joined the faculty at Brooklyn College in 2005 after teaching for 21 years at Texas Tech University. He earned his BA from Carleton College and his MA and PhD from Brandeis University. Over the years, he has lived and conducted research in Paris, Provence, Picardy, Alsace, Normandy, and the Limousin. He has taught at the Université de Limoges and held a Fulbright Senior Research Fellowship at the School for Advanced Studies in the Social Sciences in Paris. In 2008, he was president of the Western Society for French History and served as chair of the Department of History at Brooklyn College from 2005 to 2013. He is the author of Old Age and the Old Regime, Image and Experience in 18th Century France, and Aging in World History, and a co-editor on Transnational Spaces and Identities in the Francophone World and the French Revolution in Culture and Society. To talk about Professor Troyansky with us, we have today with us Rodwan. Rodwan, thank you for being here. Oh, thank you for inviting me. This is great. So, Rodwan, what is it like working with Professor Troyansky? What is it like taking a class with him? You, you know him pretty well. So, my first class with Professor Troyansky was fall 2020. What That was like the first fully online semester. And it was when I first decided to become a history major. So, his French Revolution class was my first history, like level 3000 history course. And I remember... You know, like he when he had first assigned like a three page paper, I was losing my mind running around like, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to do that. I'm a terrible writer. There's no way it's possible. And then like the end of the semester rolls by and it's like, oh, that actually wasn't so bad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, immediately after that. So spring 21, I took his love, death and magic class, which he actually assigned a medium length research paper for at the end. He spoke with all of us one on one to talk about what we wanted to write about. And I thought it was really fun not just to do like the research, but also just to talk about it. And like, you know, it's like, hey, this really niche topic sounds really interesting. And he's like, oh, I get it. That's awesome. Now, 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 now the thing that students usually want to know going into a class with a teacher they haven't taken is what kind of workload they can expect, how the class is usually conducted and everything. Can you give us a little insight for that? Sure. So from my time taking the French Revolution class with him, the beginning, like the reading, I think it's like, what you would expect for like a, a like a normal history class, like probably uh, I'll throw a ballpark like a hundred pages a week, right between two classes. Um, his love, death, and magic one was a little like heavier than that. He had asked of us to write two around like approximately like five page response papers to two books that we were reading. By the end of the semester, we had read two entire like historical works. One from a historian from i think like the 70s carlo ginsburg and then another historian who's writes more recently i think i'm gonna butcher her name i think helen roper but the love death and magic course that that paper was longer than our final for our french revolution one so like if you can handle like the normal history coursework it's probably not that bad but it could still be pretty lengthy well i think we should get right to it then rodwan thank you for that yeah let's hear right from man himself, Professor David Troyansky. Everybody, please give a warm welcome to Professor David Troyansky. Thank you so much, Professor Troyansky, for being on our Professor podcast. Happy to be here. For our first question, we're going to start with why did you choose your area of study? Did it change over time? And was there a particularly important professor or mentor at any stage of your education? Well, I think there have been two tracks in my scholarly career. One has been French history, and the other has been the history of aging and the history of old age. And let me begin with, with France, because I think in some ways it was growing up in Brooklyn that made me very aware of how close Europe was. And I kind of grew up on European culture. And so when I was young, I was much more interested in that history than in American history, although there was a time in my life when I even taught U.S. history, though not at Brooklyn College. 
And French was the first foreign language I studied. And when I was in college, I was really influenced by a particular professor, a man by the name of Carl Wiener, who was a New Yorker, but this was at Carleton College in Minnesota. He drew me into the study of French history, and it was only partly about the content of French history. He taught a course in the French Revolution that kind of marked me for the rest of my life, but he also introduced me to French historiography and particularly uh, approaches to social and cultural history in early modern Europe. And that, I think, in some ways was even more important than the history of France in terms of my becoming a historian. And I'm still doing that sort of stuff. So in the fall, I'm teaching a course called Love, Death and Magic in Europe, 1500 to 1800. And that allows me to go back to that sort of first love of early modern social and cultural history. And once I got involved in doing the history of France, it's just one thing led to another. And while the the work on aging is very much more global, I, I still think of myself primarily as a historian of France. To uh, transition a little bit to one of your works, your book titled Old Aid and the Old Regime, Image and Experience in 18th Century France, it, quote, combines social and cultural history to explore major shifts in French attitudes towards aging and the aged in the 18th century from one extreme of ridicule and neglect to another of respect and care. What did the shift look like in French culture and what factors brought about? Okay. And I should point out, that's a really old book at this point. And if I were to rewrite it, I might downplay a little bit that shift, just in the sense that while I think the shift was real, there are older ways of thinking that survived. It's not as if you go from one thing to another, but they coexist. And what, what I tried to do in that book was to do both social and cultural history. And on the cultural side, the shift was visible in the representations of old people. So whether I was looking at art, whether I was looking at fiction or theater, whether I was looking at philosophical texts or religious texts or very early sorts of social scientific work in that era, in a sense, you could say the social sciences are born in that era, there seemed to be a shift from, let's say, more traditional view of old age to one that was unbelievably positive and respectful. And I was interested in how that happened. I also thought about why it happened. And one explanation is much more cultural. It's about a kind of secularization and emphasis on this world rather than the next. And old age can be seen as a kind of reality and social problem and so on. But it's before the era of dramatic demographic aging. That comes much later. But there's already an increase in life expectancy in the period. And that may have had something to do with it. I was really interested also in looking at relations between generations. So I did a village study where I was looking at how families would pass property along and how an older generation would have the younger generation sign a notarized contract that, yeah, the property is being passed along, but you need to make sure that I have enough, uh, a roof over my head and food and drink and so on. And so I was interested in both the sort of cultural realm and the more socioeconomic one. And so that was what I was doing there. Since then, as I say, I've been looking at old age much more globally. And so I did a book on aging and world history in came out in 2016 that was a kind of survey of the scholarly literature on that. And so there's always a fair amount of France in what I do, but it's mostly not about France. And I'm I'm busy co-editing a, a multi-authored multi-volume cultural history of old age that should appear maybe by the end of 2024. Uh, it may bleed into 2025, but yeah. In your History of Modern France class, which I took with you online, which I, I really enjoyed that class, we read about the idea that the successes and failures of each republic, empire, and conflict after the French Revolution are important to understanding the revolution's success or failure long after the events of the late 18th century. France's history of rebellion and protest has continued right up to today with such events as the retirement protests. I mean, even down to people are joking online that, you know, America doesn't know how to protest. France knows how to protest way better. How has the memory of the revolution changed over time? And what are some of the ways it's used in French society today? I remember you were in that class and I remember we had lots of great conversations. You're right to single out the history of revolution. It's certainly a good way of structuring 
19th century history because every generation there's another revolution whether it's 1789 to 99 whether it's the overthrow of the regime by napoleon or whether it's the overthrow of napoleon whether it's the 1830 revolution 1848 1870 71 the centuries punctuated by that and in a way revolution becomes an important part of historical memory there are historians who at the time of the bicentennial of the french revolution talked about the role of that revolution in the creation of modern political culture. So it's like revolution itself is an important part of the, the political mix, that it's thinkable because it's happened. One can point to a few events in the, uh, in the 20th century as well, and now in the 21st, as maintaining a kind of memory of revolution. It took about 100 years for the French Revolution to become sort of normalized in French political culture, that until then, there was a kind of civil war over the French Revolution. You were for or against. And by the time you get to the Third Republic, beginning 1870, and particularly then the 1880s and beyond, uh, there's this notion that that's an important part of our history, and we sort of accept it, uh, even if it includes the year of so-called terror. I think if we were to skip to the present, I think there are memories of the revolution that are alive in the street, in people's heads. There are ways in which people talked about changes in regime in the 20th century, whether it was overcoming the period of occupation in Vichy during World War II, or the coming of the Fifth Republic in 1958, or a year of revolution in 1968. And people even talked about the coming to power of the left in the 1980s as a kind of revolution. I was in Paris for a number of the protests this year, and I remember one in particular that took place on January 21st. Now, January 21st is the date when Louis XVI was executed in 1793. And this particular demonstration, this particular march, went from the Place de la Bastille, important site in revolutionary memory, to the Place de la Nation in eastern Paris. And it went right through the sort of working class revolutionary neighborhood of the Faubourg Saint Antoine. So anybody who was participating in this would naturally think about echoes of revolution in what they were doing. There was one guy who had a poster that made reference to this saying, today's January 21st, remember, we beheaded one king in the past. And there is this image of Emmanuel Macron that he can't shake, of being a king or wannabe emperor. Sometimes he's depicted being on a royal throne, sometimes he's depicted as a kind of Napoleonic character. And so there's a reminder, we've done this before, and there's the kind of arrogance of Macron and his government. And it came together in the protests over the reform of uh, the retirement age. And I was interested in this because, I mean, I've got a book coming out this summer about French retirement in the 19th century. So I went to these demonstrations as a kind of participant observer. Uh, at one point, I was handed a, a sign to, to carry. I, I've still got it here. And I, you know, held it up uh, like everybody else, uh, a little bit sheepishly. But anyway, it was clear that echoes of revolution mattered. There was a comfort that people have with protesting, something you mentioned before, comparing France and the U.S. And at least the first demonstrations were really very festive. And that sometimes has been an aspect of revolutionary culture of people getting together in the street. But it was also a way that people wanted to defend a right that they'd achieved. How dare you try and push the retirement age back? There was also the notion that, well, life is not just work. And so the idea that the life course should include a period of recreation, of leisure, of volunteering, of grandparenting, of whatever, that that's important. And it shouldn't just be something that's talked about in terms of work and the marketplace. So I think we can see the, those echoes. And lately, there have been more and more discussions of the need for a constitutional change, because Macron pushed through this law on retirement in a very anti-democratic way, avoiding a, a parliamentary vote. People were really angry about that. And so there are more people who are imagining, well, what if we did change regimes? And what if we created a sixth republic? The fifth has been around since 58. So, you know, stay tuned. I did not take your history of modern French class on, on Zoom, nor have I taken any of your other classes, which I sorely regret. Hopefully I'll see you in the graduate school at some point. 
for myself and many students who have not taken you, when we're signing up for a Professor Troyansky class, what can we look forward to? Kind of how do you structure your class? How do you grade things? How do you give out assignments? What, what can I expect as a prospective student? I think a lot depends upon what the particular class is. But if I had to generalize, I'd say that there's always been a balance between lecturing and discussion. And over the years, I think I've moved a little bit more away from lecturing. I mean, I find it very easy. I've been doing it for forever. But I think it's much more valuable for students to participate and they get more out of it. But that's a little riskier from my point of view, because I'm then dependent upon students to be prepared with the reading. I mean, I could always count on on, on Micah, of course, and, and some other <laughs> students uh, in those classes. That, But you want to make sure that everyone is involved. And maybe if I had to point to things that are particular about my, my classes, I tend to use a lot of images. I tend to use a lot of primary sources. And actually using those can be a way of uh, roping in the students who uh, hadn't prepared as well as, as some of their classmates because they can read something in front of them or they can see an image in front of them. And then we can have that discussion. I think after so many years of doing this, and particularly in the, the history of France, and so much time that I've spent in France, I do tend to include maybe a bit more of my own experiences in the country when I'm teaching French history. And so I have a lot more to draw on just for having been there so much and having uh, lived so long at this point. So I think it's it's that. I think if I had to talk about other things like that early modern course or my courses on the Enlightenment, I think students will probably get a sense that I'm still rather excited about these topics. And so that's something that I hope students will feed off that kind of energy and then I can feed off on off theirs. But my ideal in some ways, um, let, let me back up. When I think back to the professors I had when I was in college, there was one who only lectured. He couldn't lead a discussion to save his life, but he was a brilliant lecturer. And so I've tried to learn some things from what I remember of what he did. But I had another professor who never lectured. We come into class, we will have read some primary sources. We almost never read secondary sources in that class. This was in medieval history, but we would read these primary sources. And the entire class consisted of discussion. And so there are ways in which I model my teaching on both of them. And the ideal for me is one where we just talk and I don't have to lecture. Uh, but if I have to, I can. <laughs> <laughs> The French identity is a complex and changing concept. You could argue like a lot of other national identities, but for instance, France relied heavily on its overseas empire for liberation during World War II, but didn't apply its ideas of liberty, equality, and fraternity to those colonies. A place like Algeria was considered France, but its people had to act, dress, work, and live a certain way if they wanted to try to attain Frenchness. How has the identity of being French changed over time? And what have been the signifiers of French identity? Which groups have faced difficulties in being seen as equal French citizens? Okay, well, I, I mean, I think you've pointed to the answers to your questions already. The experience of empire, also the importance of immigration. There's a declining birth rate in France in the 19th century and a shortage of labor. And so you find lots of people moving to France some of them come from the French Empire or French colonies, but some of them come from elsewhere, even other European countries. And if we look back at the period of the late 19th, early 20th centuries, we think about the United States as the biggest recipient of immigrants. France is number two in that period. And so there has traditionally been this, this sense that France depends upon a certain kind of diversity. It becomes a somewhat different kind of issue after uh, World War II. You point to the Algerian War. Of course, the larger experience for France in that period, including the experience of Algeria, is one of decolonization. And while there was a certain resistance to decolonization, there was eventually a kind of acceptance that, yeah, this is inevitable. So while there had been traditional notions of Frenchness, of what to refer to a, a, a slogan of decades ago, but also a, a book written by a, a Stony Brook historian, Jean Lebovitz, this notion of true France. What was true France? And you could say that, oh, there are certain 
markers. There are certain foods. There's bread and wine. There's cheese. De Gaulle had a famous line about how you couldn't possibly have French unity because there were you know, more than 200 different kinds of, of, of wine or cheese. I forget what it was exactly, but this incredible sort of regional sense, a regional identity, and the coexistence of regional identity with an emerging national identity. This is a real issue in contemporary France. I don't remember if I was using the book uh, Global France when you took that course on uh, on France, but there's a, a way in which the notion of France as a on the one hand, the idea of a universal nation, but also a, a very diverse nation, this is important both for historians and for ordinary people. And there are obstacles to going the sort of American route of multiculturalism. There are some people who find that very attractive. There are other people, both on the right and on the left, who find that a little scary. And they have a certain idea of assimilation to France and Frenchness, and uh, an idea that, well, that's open to everybody. It's not about race. It's not about religion. It's not about language. Well, maybe it's about language. But in any case, that's a current issue. And I think when we look at French culture in the late 20th, early 21st centuries, a lot of what happens in the realm of music and art and theater and film, this is something that is rooted not so much in traditional notions of Frenchness, but in immigrant experiences and the experience of diversity. But there's a kind of love-hate relationship with the United States. And there are those who say, well, we don't want American notions of multiculturalism. We, we want people to assimilate regardless of where they come from and then accept them. And there's this way in which a lot of French people kind of deluded themselves into thinking that that was an easy thing or that there was no racism in France. And certainly, there's a history of African-Americans, some African-Americans living in France and finding a, a, a more welcoming atmosphere than what they'd experienced in the United States. But it's not as simple as that. And there's French racism, too. So that's very much an issue. I imagine it will be an issue as long as I teach that course. It's not disappearing. It reminds me a lot of how when France lost the World Cup this year, that a lot of its naturalized players who come from African countries, when they win the, the game, they're, they're French players, but if, when they lose the game, they're African immigrant players. That's absolutely true. But you you go back to the end of the 20th century and you go back to the World Cup where there was this sort of discovery, oh, we are this diverse country. And there's that positive image of France. But let me, let me pick up on something you said. We were talking about naturalized citizens. The overwhelming number of people born in France, right? It may be their parents or their grandparents who were the immigrant generation. So at what point do people who were born in France become recognized as, as fully equal? Or to what extent are they saddled with the idea that, oh, they're still outsiders, they're immigrants, when in fact they're not. They're Parisian or they're from uh, uh, Saint-Saint-Denis, uh, whatever. You've lived and researched in many different parts of France. What would have been your favorite places to be in and why? Okay, that's a little hard because I have worked in so many places, but I'll single out two. So I'm ignoring Provence, I'm ignoring Normandy, I'm ignoring uh, Alsace. So I spend a lot of time in Paris and I love Paris and it feels like a second home. But it's it's a Paris that's def defined by the corner bakery. It's also defined by proximity to places where I work, where I do research. So it means the Bibliothèque Nationale, it means the Archive Nationale. And there are some academic institutions that feel like a second home in Paris as well, either because I've participated in seminars or spoken in seminars, and so I feel at home there. I've lived in a lot of neighborhoods of Paris, but in Recent visits, I, I, I keep coming back to the same neighborhood on the left bank uh, in the 13th arrondissement, so southeast Paris, and a neighborhood that, that's called the Butokai, which is kind of a hilly area south of the Place d'Italie. And it's not heavily touristed. There, there's one street which gets a lot of sort of bar and restaurant traffic, a lot of young people, but it's been my neighborhood recently. And there's a great market nearby, so I feel at home there. And I love just walking in Paris or getting on a bus and traveling from neighborhood to neighborhood. The other place I'll mention is a place I spent a lot of time. It's not heavily touristed. The city I'm going to mention is not 
the prettiest city in the country. But the region is the Limousin in southwest central France, and the city is Limoges. Limoges is most famous for porcelain factories. In the 19th and 20th centuries, it was really the most important place for the production of porcelain. And it was an important place in the 19th century for the development of French socialism. It's a kind of sleepy provincial city. You talk to people who, who live there, you talk to older people, they talk about their kids and grandkids who have all moved elsewhere. The countryside is is very pleasant. It's very green. It's very hilly. And I became attached to that region. I taught for a year at the University of Limoges back in the 1990s. And it was a wonderful experience of being inside the French system. I lived with my family on a tree farm outside of the city. So we rented this little cottage that was near our landlord's chateau on a huge property. It was really quite idyllic. I actually have a project that is set there that I'm working on. And this is one of the things I was doing when I was in France from January to March. I have a project having to do with provincial intellectuals across the French Revolution and in the aftermath of the revolution. And there's this one guy I've gotten interested in, in Limoges, and also a property owner in the countryside, who lived through that period and played a role in the revolution locally. But he was also a writer and a farmer and a man who wrote in a lot of different areas of intellectual life. So in history and philosophy and political science and psychology and agronomy. And so this guy that you've never heard of called Juge de Saint-Martin uh, drew me back into the archives there. So that's something I'm working on. But in some ways, I became attracted to a France, you know, as a place to live rather than a place to be a tourist. And also, of course, a place to work in the archives. The idyllic cottage sounds so lovely. Well, and I, I could add that the landlord was a descendant of Louis XVI's lawyer back in <laughs> December of 1792. So when we first <laughs> met and we were thinking about renting this place, they said, are, are you related to the Défenseur of, uh, you know, Louis XVI? And he said, oh, yes. He was delighted to know that <laughs> to me, but of course it did. Um, anyway, it was a, a, a wonderful time. You've mentioned a few of the things you're, you're working on and things coming up throughout the interview, but can you remind us of a few of them right here uh, for people to get excited about? Sure. Uh, so there, there's a book called Entitlement and Complaint, Ending Careers and Reviewing Lives in Post-Revolutionary France. And that's I'm actually finishing the corrections of the page proofs right now, and that's coming out with Oxford University Press. I'm also co-editing for Bloomsbury Press, a, a six-volume cultural history of old age, which is uh, sort of an experience of herding cats because there are 48 authors scattered around the world. And oh uh, I'm co-editing the 19th century volume with an American historian, but I'm also co-editing all of the volumes as sort of general editor with a colleague who's in Australia. Uh, and then there's the project on provincial intellectuals. So yeah, I've got a lot of this going on. And I'm also going to be getting ready to to teach again in the fall. And some of this work feeds into my teaching because in doing early modern Europe or doing the French Revolution or doing modern France, it's obvious where there are those connections. But I'm also doing a colloquium on age and history where some of the stuff I've done on aging finds a, a place, but I'll be doing childhood as well as old age in that course. Well, it comes down to our favorite uh, section of the interview. Fast five questions, very quick, no thinky, do you have a favorite book? Oh, there are too many. Uh, <laughs> let, me, let, me let me do this. Um, let me point to a, a few. So when I was your age, the book that most influenced me was The Magic Mountain by Thomas Mann. And when I was an undergraduate and contemplating a history major, it was a book by Marc Bloch called French Rural History that uh, led me to stay in the library all night and not go meet my friends at the movies. So that was an important moment. But recently, I mean, I've been reading books by, by friends, uh, Robert Schneider, uh, The Return of Resentment, a novelist named Julia Langbein called uh, a book called American Mermaid. I really like the works of Ben Lerner in the English department at Brooklyn. And for a, a, a sort of trip back to the Brooklyn of my childhood, uh, James McPherson's Deacon King Kong, which is about the African-American community in Brooklyn in, uh, in the 1960s. I could go on, but I'll stop. Next question. Favorite food? Oh, um, despite the fact that I love French cuisine, what I look forward to in going to France is having a good couscous. Here, here's a weird one. So one weekend while I was working in France, I visited friends in Rome 
And they sent me to a little bakery in the old Jewish ghetto of Rome, which made something called pizza ebraica, which would translate as Jewish pizza. It is not pizza. It's a kind of breakfast bar made with candied citron. And it's the ugliest thing you can imagine. And it's the most delicious. I had never heard of it. <laughs> and, uh, uh, my, my wife, who's a great baker, was able to reproduce it because somebody who was also taken with it tried to reproduce it and posted a recipe online. And it works. Favorite non-work activity? Travel, listening to music, hiking, movies. Your favorite thing to do in New York City specifically? Walking around, but, you know, music, art, theater. I sort of grew up going to the Metropolitan Opera, the Metropolitan Museum, the Village Vanguard for jazz. And I'm old enough to have gone when I was in high school to the Fillmore East. Oh, that's cool. And last but not least, everyone's favorite, a favorite music genre. Okay. There are a lot of things. First thing to say is um, chamber music and opera, but another is jazz. But I'm going to do a kind of shout out to something very different because a few weeks ago, my son turned us on to uh, a couple of singer songwriters whom we saw in Northampton, Massachusetts, named Langhorn Slim and John Craigie. Look them up. Really good. Well, that's, thank you for the recommendations. Yeah. Uh, Professor Stransky, this was a, a wonderful interview. This was so much fun. Thank you Such a uh, pleasure. again for doing this. My pleasure. Look forward to seeing you in person. Our Professor Podcast was recorded with the permission of the Brooklyn College History Department and our student interviewees. We would like to thank both the students and faculty for their contributions.